I'm not saying let's live forever. I don't think any transhumanists are saying that. I think what we want is the choice to be able to live indefinitely. That might be 10,000 years, that might only be 170 years. Hi, I'm Zach Weissmuller for Reason TV. We're here with Zoltan Istvan. He is a philosopher, futurist, and writer of the book, The Transhumanist Wager. He's also announced his intentions to run for president with the Transhumanist Party. Zoltan, thank you very much for talking to us. Thanks for having me. What is transhumanism? Is it a political ideology? Is it a social movement? Explain what it is. Well, it's really all of the above, but I like to just refer to it as kind of an international movement of people that are trying to use science and technology to radically enhance the human being and also uh, enhance the human experience. But it's really about using science and technology to improve the species itself. What are some examples of how you would do that? One of my favorite examples is heart disease. They have been testing out robotic hearts in France and uh, you know, heart disease is number one killer in America. Um, at some point in the future, hopefully within 10 years, we will electively start having heart transplants with these robotic hearts. And this is a classic transhumanist technology that could literally eliminate heart disease. Just to get a little background on you, you were a National Geographic reporter, a kind of world traveler. How did those experiences bring you to transhumanism? One of the stories I was doing was on in Vietnam on bomb diggers. We dropped you know, millions of tons of bombs on Vietnam. About 10 or 15% of those bombs went unexploded. And I was doing a story on the locals that are digging up these unexploded bombs and selling the metal for money. I came very close to stepping on a landmine. My guide pushed me out of the way on, while I was on assignment in the, the demilitarized zone there in Vietnam. And uh, after four years of doing some really heavy reporting, including covering the Kashmir War, I just kind of thought I was sort of done with um, dangerous things. And I want to actually contribute something that in case something bad did happen, I could actually, you know, help that, that movement forward. And transhumanism is really, I say the number one goal of transhumanism is trying to conquer death. So that is the stated goal of transhumanism is to actually overcome death? Well, that's certainly, I would say, the top priority of most transhumanists, but the goals of transhumanists are pretty varied, too. I'd say a lot of them want to uh, also improve their life. Um, some want to completely eliminate suffering. Um, others just want to have it so that they could have um, kind of new body parts, so they can do incredible things, new sports, uh, you know, run as fast as cheetahs. I mean, these are all things that are part of the transhumanist future. So there's a lot of reasons for doing it, but I'd say the number one reason is transhumanists would like to overcome human death. People get um, suspicious and maybe even a little creeped out when you are trying to take death out of the equation because then you're starting to become something that is not quite human and it's unsettling for some people. How do we get people to overcome that kind of innate revulsion and keep pushing forward when they first hear about these things? To begin with, the very best way to do that is to try to change the, the kind of the paradigm that we sort of all believe in. America and many places around the world are quite religious, especially America. I was just writing an article, the poll said 83% still are declaring themselves selves Christian. And um, that makes it hard to want to take death out of the equation because a natural part of the Christian ideology is to die and to eventually reach an afterlife with God. And transhumanists, it's not that they're anti-religious or they're only atheists because they're not, they're all across the board. But overcoming death is not something that's associated in a, a kind of a religious framework. They simply associate it with wanting to just live indefinitely because they love life. And so I'm trying to, as a transhumanist, tell people the same thing. It's, it's not that wanting to live indefinitely is something that is going to intrude or conflict with one's religion. It's just something that is the kind of evolving nature of the species. And if you can get people to think like that and not see it in conflict with their ideologies, then I think they're going to be more on board with saying, yeah, it's good to live 150, 200 years. And again, I'm not saying let's live forever. I don't think any transhumanists are saying that. I think what we want is the choice to be able to live indefinitely. That might be 10,000 years, that might only be 170 years. And do you think most people want to live for thousands or tens of thousands of years? Absolutely. I'm convinced that what has happened is we have been taught that we should die. We have been taught the uh, 
the, this taboo of living indefinitely or having too much power because after all, except for the last few hundred years, we've been a species that's been subject to diseases and war and, and lots of terrible things. Once people think it through and once people realize that this science and technology is actually here and certainly will be here I think in 10, 20, 30 years when they start stopping aging and reversing aging, they're going to start saying, wow, this, this is great. Yeah, I can have multiple careers. I can um, have more time with my family. I, I can watch my kids you know, grow to whatever they want to do. We talked a little bit about the kind of sense of disgust or revulsion people just innately feel when, when they think of something that's in between human and, and non-human. And there's another group of people that face that in a very real way by defying categories, and that would be people in the transgender movement. And you wrote a very interesting article for Psychology Today about the overlap between the LGBT movement and the transhumanism. Could you explain that a little bit? Why do you see a common ground there? The LGBT movement and transhumanist Transhumanism has kind of a common bond in fighting for basic civil rights to do what they want with their bodies. We generally call this morphological freedom. And this idea to, we have the right to do with you know, ourselves whatever we want as long as it's not hurting someone. And so I believe that we should try to uh, merge the movements a little bit more and, and use each other um, as a way to uh, open up the, the dialogue because the LGBT movement is also going to be changing because of transhumanism. Um, we're moving to a world where there's going to be post-genderism. You know, there might not be gender. Or there's going to be this ectogenesis concept or artificial wombs. Um, they're going to have designer babies that might not even have a uterus in them because some women don't want to have menstrual cycles. We're getting to a world where science and technology could be drastically changing the human being such that the LGBT movement will have to transform itself. And frankly, it's going to become, um, uh, it's going to merge in a way with transhumanism. What does the government's role and politicians' role need to be in this? You know, I tend to think that it's best when government sort of stays out of the way. But I think one of the main things that we're pushing for is, for example, we're, all, we're involved in all these far-off wars all over the place, America is. I would have um, suggested that we take a significant portion of the defense budget, and I don't mean a giant portion, but just a portion of it, and instead of spending it on far off wars, we spend it on life extension medicine. This is something that we can directly do for the people. We can improve their health. If we spent $1 trillion in the life extension uh, industry, I'd say within 10 years, we would literally conquer human mortality. From my perspective, it seems like the government gets in the way of a lot of the innovations that you're talking about. When we see things like 23andMe, which is a technology that allows you to look at your own genome, FDA put the kibosh on it. Genetically modified organisms, oh, there's this ongoing fear and legislation surrounding that. There's anxiety about genetic engineering of babies. Will the state stop transhumanism in its tracks, or are you optimistic that it can overcome and route around that obstacle? I absolutely believe that the government creates way too much red tape. And, um, and way too much bureaucracy and slows down the process. For example, when George Bush stopped uh, for stem cell development for eight years, you know, we lost ground in that technology. And that technology is now promising to be one of the most important technologies of the 21st century. I think they get in the way and they shouldn't be allowed to get in the way. I have actually in, uh, advocated for some type of policy that would say it's actually illegal for government to get in the way when it concerns life extension um, medicines and technologies. Looking forward to, let's say, the next five to ten years, what are the most promising technologies uh, in achieving life extension? 3D printing of organs. Um, basically, most people die from organ failure. And if you could create new types of organs, either by uh, 3D printing them with some type of material, or by creating robotic organs, or just by improving the organs that we have, you can piece by piece make it so that whenever you get a problem, you're able to fix it, and therefore this, you know, the human being can live longer. I think one of the other really um, important technologies that came out this last year that's been in the news is this suspended animation where they're taking gunshot victims in the university in, in Pittsburgh, and uh, they're able to keep them clinically dead for two to four hours just because they put saline through their system, and they keep them very cool, and then they're able to bring them back after they've kind of fixed them all up. Next year, it might be eight hours. In five years, it could easily be 24 hours. And scientists specifically are starting to fuzz the line between life and death. And the more resources we spend on this as a nation, the more we encourage you know, innovation regarding these things, then we're going to find ourselves living longer and better and just you know, feeling our, our well-being and our safety is much more intact than it's ever been. 
Zoltan Ishvan, thank you very much for talking to us. Thanks so much for having me. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller. <laughs> <laughs>